Welcome to the Cowboy Up Podcast, where talk is all about the West. This episode is brought to you by White Stallion Ranch and produced by Cowboy Spirit USA. Roads are everywhere. Lanes, avenues, highways, freeways, ranch roads, forest roads, county roads. We need them. But does planet Earth? Ben Goldfarb joins Russell and Allen to talk about road ecology and his fascinating new book, Crossings. Well, Russell and Ellen, uh, what is the desert like today? It's rainy. We we were rainy. Now it's beautiful and sunny. It's always nice. The desert has turned green in 24 hours, and that is such a wonderful phenomenon to see. I always enjoy that. You know, it's interesting you say that because I uh, two days ago it was raining. I thought I don't see the reaction yet. And I drove out our front road, and it was as green as a golf course. It's about one quarter of an inch high, but that grass, the desert is unique in that in that in, almost instantaneous reaction to rain. And then it, it lasts just a very short period as well, but uh, yeah, it's phenomenal when that happens. And our front road was so great. I, I you know, we we spent quite a bit of money and we 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 actually our old ranch road that had never been engineered correctly and had been abused over the years we finally got a guy in who knows how to do a road and uh, despite the rain it was just right and i know roads are a big thing at lazy b and your other ranches i mean that's a big thing right well yeah uh, it uh you, you the ranch isn't functional if you can't get to it right so <laughs> And we, you had what ten miles at Mustang Meadows and eight, eight miles, miles at Lazy, Lazy B. B. Yes, yeah. yeah. So and didn't have uh, the the best thing I ever figured out was we worked and worked and worked on the roads and every time it would rain you, you don't want to work on a road when it's dry because it just makes potholes. But uh, we'd work on the road. But the best thing I ever figured out was one year I. Killed a beef and I gave half of it to the county road boss, and that <laughs> solved more road problems than I can even tell you. <laughs> Cattle rancher solution to bad roads. Yeah. So anyway, today we have someone uh, who's written about roads and highways, and it's a big topic, really. And you know, it's one of those things that I, I maybe it's a classic that we take advantage of roads and, and highways. Ben Goldfarb is the author of Crossings: How Road Ecology Is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. His writing has also appeared in the Atlantic, National Geographic, the New York Times. Um, he's won a lot of awards and fellowships, including one from the Whiting Foundation. His previous book was Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. Boy, there's a controversial topic. You know, my uncle thought beavers were, were just giant rats and hated them, and yet they're so critical to the environment, and, and people are are really working hard to to bring them back. And, and, you know, as you learn more, you realize that's important. So that's an important book. And, of course, uh, for us in Arizona, um, Ben's been at the, uh, and will be, at the Tucson Festival of Books, March 9th and 10th, and, and Ben's joining us from Colorado. Um, welcome, Ben. Hey, well, thank you guys so much for having me, and, and fun to uh, hear your own uh, road and, and beaver stories. Those are my two <laughs> favorite topics, and it's, <laughs> I figured you guys would have some experience in those those uh, arenas. Well, you can't be a rancher and not be concerned with the roads, because how do you get there right. if you... So, we're, we're tickled to have you today. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you guys for having me on. Well, perfect. Uh, how did... How did roads become a topic for you? Yeah, it's a, you know it's a it's a good question, I and mean, I think that so you know I'm a I'm a I'm an environmental journalist, and I write about you know conservation biology and uh, ecology, and so you kind of can't escape roads, right? They're they're uh, sort of at the heart of you know so much of what is uh, in, endangering wildlife on this uh, on this planet. And uh, about ten years ago, in, in 2013, uh, I had the chance to uh, visit. Uh, a bunch of wildlife crossing structures, you know, these overpasses and underpasses that allow animals to uh, 
safely, uh, you know, go o- over and under highways. And, you know, I know you guys have uh, a bunch of those in Arizona and, and the ones that I was checking out in 2013 were in, uh, Montana, uh, north of Missoula on, on highway 93. And I, I had, I had the chance to go up on top of one of these wildlife overpasses and it was just so interesting and inspiring and, and cool. And I, you know, I really loved the intellectual challenge of it too. You know, I was hanging out with these road ecologists, you know, these scientists who study this topic. And we were talking about, you know, all of the different features that you need to create a, a built piece of infrastructure that is appealing to, you know, black bears and moose and elk and bobcats, all of the different creatures that, uh, you know, inhabit that ecosystem and have to cross the highway. You know, we were talking about, uh, you know, adding, you know, rock piles and logs for voles and, you know, sort of visual screens of vegetation so that, uh, you know, bears wouldn't be turned off by headlights. It just seems like, you know, an incredibly complex, intellectually fascinating topic. How do you, uh, you know, how do you, how do other animals experience our built environment and uh, how do we create infrastructure that's uh, safer for everybody? So that was really uh, what got me fired up back in uh, in 2013. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I, I got invited as, as as just simply a rancher landowner in a, in a kind of a, at least in many people's view, a critical wildlife pattern. Um, pathway and so I got invited to this group there were 60 or 80 environmentalists and and one rancher who didn't really have any valuable input being me and so I did a lot of listening and it was interesting because they were talking about the overpass that that we had here and they and and folks that were supporters of it were saying it wasn't working and that was quite a few years ago and it's interesting because now they tell me it's it's working really well and uh, so you're talking about sort of the logistics and the, the details, like so many things that are making it succeed or not. And, and so, um, that's an example. Well, I, I guess as, as an outsider, it was failing and now it's working. Well, yeah, you know, I, th- I think that's a kind of a common, a common story. You hear that a lot in the, the world of wildlife crossings because, you know, animals have to find these things and use these things and get comfortable with them, right? You know, you, I mean, you think about, um, you know, especially here in Colorado, you know, we have these big herds of, you know, deer and elk and antelope, you know, these, these large ungulates that are moving across the landscape and, uh, you know, highways sort of prevent their, their migration. And so, you know, look, you put in, a wildlife overpass and underpass and you know they might not necessarily use it right away right because you know there these migration routes are are learned and they're passed along from you know fawn to or from doe to fawn within the herd uh and so you know it it, it takes them a minute i think or, you know in some cases a, a couple of years to kind of discover these crossings and to, and to incorporate them uh you know into their their new migration routes you know to sort of change where these animals move across the landscape so there are lots of stories like that where you know they they put up uh, an overpass or an underpass and, uh, you know, the animals uh, don't necessarily find it right away or, you know, some of them enter the, you know, the the underpass and then turn around because they're a little bit, you know, freaked out by, uh, you know, being under the highway. Uh, but, you know, over time, what we see time and time again is, you know, is, is passage rates increasing, you know, more and more animals going through and, and uh, you know, those ungulates especially really incorporating those, uh, you know, those passages into their migration routes. So, you know, I think the, the story you're telling where, uh, you know, a crossing is uh, initially, uh, you know, not super effective and then becomes really effective over time. That's a, a pretty classic story. How how much study does it take to locate uh, an underpass or an overpass? Do you just walk out and say, <laughs> we'll put it here, the animals will learn? Or, uh, you know, how, how what's the what's the story of that? Yeah, so that's a a great, a great question. You know, it's really, it's a combination of factors that go into, into citing these, uh, these crossings. I mean, you know, there's, we're kind of the first layer of data, right? Is, is, you you know, you're commonly looking at roadkill rates, you know, where are the animals getting hit on the highway? Uh, you know, that's, that's usually a pretty good indication of, you know, where they're trying to cross and, you know, where you might want to, mitigate but you know it's also really important to get some uh you know some collars out on these animals you know some some satellite or radio collars that basically tell you you know where they're moving around the landscape because you know you think about some of the big interstates out there you know i-70 i-80 i-90 uh you know these are these are 
roads that are so densely trafficked that animals don't even try to cross them, right? There's this, you know, kind of impenetrable wall of traffic. So, you know, there aren't, there's not necessarily a lot of roadkill on those big interstate highways because the animals never try to cross at all. So, you know, in that case, you know, you definitely want, uh, you know, you want these tracking collars on, on critters to tell you, okay, here's where they're approaching the highway, uh, and probably where they would want to cross, you know, if they, if they could. And then, you know, a lot of it is, uh, you know, a lot of it is also just looking at the terrain, you know, the, the ecosystem itself, right? Uh, obviously animals are following water. So, you know, typically those, you know, those riparian areas are, are good spots for, uh, for underpasses as well. So it's kind of a combination of, you know, roadkill, animal tracking, you know, the topography itself, all those different components and layers are, are, are being combined to figure out where you're going to put uh, a crossing. Do you teach the animal where the crossing is or do you just take, take advantage of, of study that, that this is where it should be? You know, this is where the, if the road wasn't here, they, this is where the animal would be going right now. Well, it's, you know, one of the great things that happen is, is that the, the animals kind of teach themselves, right? You know, you get, you get, uh, you know, a, a female, uh, you know, a female mule deer or black bear or bobcat or, you know, coyote, uh, you know, using one of these crossings and, uh, you know, they teach their, uh, you know, fawns and cubs and kits and pups how to, how to use them. And, uh, you know, there's this great kind of intergenerational, knowledge transfer that uh that that happens and uh you know the other cool thing that happens too is you know look you of course you know you guys as ranchers know that uh animals follow game trails right i'm sure you know i'm sure your cows uh you know walk along uh they're the same paths you know year after year that they've created on the landscape and you know wild animals do the same thing so if you get a herd of mule deer you know walking through a wildlife underpass all of a sudden you know you've got this game trail that subsequent animals will all follow uh to the underpass you know it's almost like the entire ecosystem and the land itself learns together uh you know where these crossings are and often you know you go to these crossings and you see these amazing spider webs of of game trails you know going up into the the desert or the forest uh you know all of these different animals that have converged on the crossings over the years it's it's pretty cool to see well i you know i think that you know those game trails that's so true and you know one of my theories it's unprovable for the most part that that most of the trails dude dude ranches have for for going out riding or just um, once upon a time, they were cow or, or game trails. Uh, of course, there's a lot of overlap on that. But, you know, I, I kind of dropped the ball because that, that overpass I was talking about that is, is successful now is named after Alan's sister. And, and Ann Day was, uh, it's the Ann Day Memorial Wildlife Bridge, and, and she was killed by a drunk driver in a car accident. And, mm-hmm. you know, once again, an overachieving family, the days, so all, all three of them. Uh, you uh, guys, you guys are breaking up. I, 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 I can't, I can't hear you right now. Okay. Do you hear us now? You backed away. Hello? Okay. And, uh, so, um, anyway, the, the, the Day family, all overachievers, and Ann was a big contributor locally. So it's good that that wildlife bridge, has her name. Um, you know, I have an interesting question. I've seen uh, the Forest Service has, you know, on, on a ranch that we have, uh, endeavored to close a lot of the, the the little Forest Service roads that go out through the forest. Uh, this is out near Williams Flagstaff area. What, what's your thinking on, um, is it better to have more roads that distribute traffic in when I'm saying roads, I'm talking about, you know, UTV and Jeep roads and, you know, four wheel drive roads out through forests and national federal land or more fewer roads and more concentrated traffic. Is there an answer or does it just vary? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And I'll just say that, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that about the, um, you know, the naming of the, uh, the overpass in or in Aura Valley there. And I'm, I'm really sorry to hear, uh, about that, about, uh, Alan's, uh, your, your sister. I, I didn't, I didn't know that. And, and, um, that's, that's awful. And, and, um, I'm glad that, you know, that she's, uh, commemorated in that way. Uh, you know, as for the, 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 you know, the old, uh, Forest Service Road question, and I've got, you know, a chapter in the book about, uh, you know, those, those forest roads, because, you know, I think, Unbeknownst to most people, you know, the Forest Service, not the uh, Federal Highway Administration, is the, you know, the largest road manager in the world. There are something like 370,000 miles of, uh, you know, of, of Forest Service road. And, and you know, I, I, mean, wow. I tend to think that, 
Yeah, it's pretty pretty shocking. And yeah, you know, I think that I I tend to think that uh, you know we're better off with fewer of those things. You know, you're you're right that they distribute traffic to some extent, but you know, I think it's also important to remember that those you know all of those those dirt roads, you know, those logging roads, mining roads, ATV roads, you know, fire breaks, uh, you know, all those dirt roads, even though they're not getting a lot of traffic, you know, they still have a lot of ecological impacts, right? You know, they're, they're, those dirt roads, they're, they're constantly bleeding sediment into the, the environment. You know, you get a big, uh, you know, a big rainstorm, uh, you know, out in Arizona or, uh, you know, a big snow melt event uh, here in Colorado. And, you know, those, those, dirt roads commonly turn liquid, you know, and they just, they just hemorrhage, uh, you know, sediment downhill into streams, you know, you get uh, them smothering, uh, you know, fish spawning grounds and amphibian larvae and, you know, impairing uh, water quality. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of hydrological impacts uh, from those, those old dirt roads. So that's why, you know, I, I generally uh, feel like decommissioning those roads, you know, trying to return them to nature, uh, you know, and get some vegetation to reestablish on them and, you know, hold that, that sediment and that soil in place. You know, that's why I think that that's, that's generally a good idea because, just, you know, even though those dirt roads are not conveying a lot of traffic, you know, they're still having these big uh, sort of hydrological and even, you know, geological impacts. You know, you see uh, in, in Idaho and in Montana, for example, you know, you see these enormous landslides that are triggered uh, by old logging roads that, uh, you know, go go liquid during a, a rainstorm. So, yeah, I think, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm generally uh, in favor of you know, road decommissioning. But, you know, look, I also acknowledge that uh, those roads are super useful, right? And I, I take those forest roads all the time, you know, getting to uh, fishing holes and trailheads. And, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of how we experience our, our public lands, obviously. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, telling the forest service to go out there and, uh, you know, eliminate uh, 95% of their roads. But, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of uh, you know, obsolete roads out there that we could get rid of and, uh, you know, do some good for the, the environment. Yeah. Well, and, and on that, we're going to take a quick break. Well, this is Stan Houston once again from Cowboy Spirit USA, and we have the uh, honor and the privilege to help put this wonderful program together. And uh, speaking of being on the road, I was exactly doing that. I was able to get back to my good friends in Arizona and uh, visit with many of you and give some opportunities to you. Unfortunately, on the way back, I picked up a bit of a cold, but I'm sure that was in that Dallas airport. Certainly couldn't have been in, uh, you know, wonderful, warm Arizona. Hey, while we were there, we were attempting to help people like you who are making some decisions about how they're going to build their business, how they're going to build their life, and how they're going to get their message out into the world. And a number of them have decided that one of the things they're going to do is exactly what Russell and Alan do every week. And that is, they tell their story about their lives, obviously the White Stallion Ranch, and many of their friends who uh, are involved in the Western way of life and certainly in the Western way of doing business. And so that is what I'm going to pitch to you today as best I can. If you would like to know how you might be involved, first of all, in the sponsorship of this fine program and uh, have your name uh, put out there with your story, we'd love to hear from you. On the other hand, some of you perhaps are thinking about, you know, this would be an ideal time for me and my business to actually get in the business of podcasting, to use that means of reaching out to our audience, kind of bringing our message to life, telling our story, not only being good people in business and service, but we, uh, in fact, tell good stories and we uh, share good things and good information and help to all the people we care for. So if you'd like to uh, maybe talk to me about doing that, I would look forward to that. So why don't you reach out to me at stan at witradio.net, stan at witradio.net, and um, you tell me your story. Look forward to that. And now back to the program. Well, Ben, how, how, when, when, and how was the term road ecology coined? 
Yeah, it's a it's a, a good a good question. You know, the, the the term itself really goes back to the the mid nineteen nineties, and that it was coined by uh, a guy named Richard Foreman, a, a landscape ecologist at, uh, at at Harvard. And you know, the story that uh, that he told me was, you know, one day he was sitting around his office with a bunch of students, and you know, they were looking at this picture of a forest uh and you know they were talking about you know where the animals live and uh you know where the water moves across the landscape and you know why the people put their houses where they did but you know running right through the middle of the picture was a was a road uh and you know and, and richard as he was talking kind of stopped and said you know wait a second we know we know a lot about the ecological impacts of you know everything else in this picture we don't really know much about the road, you know, and and uh, and that was really the beginning of uh, of you know at least the term road ecology. Although you know scientists had been studying roadkill and other impacts, you know, since the early 1900s. Um, and you know, to me, I, mean, I I like that story because you know I think it kind of reveals something important about roads, which is that you know they're they're such ubiquitous daily parts of our lives, right? We use them every single day, and as a result, they're they're sort of invisible to us. You know, we don't really think about them because they're just ever present. And, uh, you know, that's one of the great things about this idea of road ecology, I think, is that it, it makes us look at roads in a new way and and, uh, and notice them in a, a way that uh, maybe we haven't historically. Well, you know, you talk about the, the hemorrhaging sediment. Uh, we have a dude ranch up in the center of Montana. And uh, it beyond it, up Upriver is a road that crosses the river, the Judith River, um, multiple times. I think it's maybe 14 times. And it's really damaged the uh, fishery. So mm. Trout Unlimited is spending a lot of money and time and effort to, to fix that and um, oh, good. change the crossings and, and restore the river because it, it has a huge impact. And, and so that, that's a concrete example of what you're talking about. Um, what is Y2Y? Y? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, Y2Y Y is, it's one of the things, one of the concepts or projects that really got me fired about this topic. And you know, Y2Y Y is basically this plan, uh, or this, this sort of proposal essentially to create this, you know, connected, wildlife corridor that runs, you know, from the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in, in Wyoming and Montana all the way to the Yukon territory in, uh, in, in Canada. Uh, you know, the idea being that, that, you know, that area of the Northern Rockies are full of, you know, all of these large, wide ranging animals, right? You've got grizzly bears and wolves and caribou and, you know, wolverines and moose, you know, all these creatures that have to roam large distances. And, uh, you know, there are all of these obstacles in their way you know you've got you know roads first and foremost uh, among those obstacles um and you know a lot of what uh, you know what what why to why you know the kind of the conservation organization does is advocate for you know more wildlife crossings and to enhance that connectivity and then you know a big part of it is also social right you know you guys being ranchers you know you know that uh, of course those carnivores can be problematic right and you know those wolves and grizzly bears especially you know kill kill livestock and you know kind of run afoul of people um so a lot of what why to why does is, is also you know try to try to implement various coexistence measures you know whether that's uh you know electric fences or uh you know range riders or other other techniques to kind of prevent those kind conflicts between, uh, you know, carnivores and, uh, and people and, and livestock. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a two pronged approach. You know, you've got the infrastructural issue with roads and wildlife crossings, and then you've got the, you know, the kind of the social, uh, issue as well. You know, how can we allow these animals to move across the landscape, uh, you know, without, uh, coming into conflict with, with people. Do you have a favorite story about, uh, about a conflict or about a Y2Y that, uh, you know, we've been talking about? You know, one of the, one of the, so, you know, it's really, so why do I, it has a lot of partners, you know, it's, yes, there's, there's one group called, you know, the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, but then it works with all of these other groups as, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you guys having some Montana connections, you know, maybe you're familiar with the, the Blackfoot Challenge, uh, folks, which is, you know, basically a, a group of ranchers who do a lot of work on carnivore, uh, coexistence, especially with, with grizzly bears. And, uh, you know, one of the cool projects that I, I visited there was basically, 
uh, you know, is sort of this boneyard essentially where, you know, ranchers whose, uh, you know, whose livestock had, had uh, died of natural causes out on the range, you know, they could bring those carcasses to this kind of central electric fenced location so that, you know, they wouldn't become a, a source of conflict for, uh, for bears especially. Uh, and then at that, at that facility, the electric fence facility, uh, all of those, uh, carcasses got turned into compost. Uh, essentially, which got used uh, for roadside revegetation uh, planting. So that was that was kind of a you know cool sort of closed loop uh, you know that uh, where those you know those carcasses could become a resource and uh, you know avoid attracting bears and uh, you know get used for some you know, soil stabilization along along roadside. I thought that was a pretty a pretty neat project. That's a little out of the box. Uh, you know, we yeah, yeah. <laughs> we operated a ranch uh, two summers, and, and we hope to be back uh, summer after this coming. OTO, Montana's Original Dude Ranch, and it's it's 11 miles from the Gardner entrance to Yellowstone. And we oh, worked nice. a lot with the Forest Service there. That's grizzly and, and elk habitat, that ranch. It's Forest Service owned. <laughs> And, and so we did a lot of electric fence stuff and we, we had to be, you know, super cognizant of, of, of protecting and, and not setting up the bears to fail. And as it worked out, we, we never even saw a bear, but, um, they, you know, they got a lot of country there and that really kind of leads to this Y2Y thing. The Forest Service talked about that's the largest, that Yellowstone ecosystem is the largest undisturbed, um, ecosystem in the u.s they talked a lot about it and i don't remember the size but it was vast and then if it could get tied to the yukon my you know that would that would be really significant yeah it'd be it'd be, it'd be huge you know and, and uh, i mean it's also especially important uh you know with, with climate change right you know we know that uh you know animals are, are sort of moving north and up slope as uh you know the planet gets hotter and uh, they have to you know go Further to, uh, you know, find resources and, uh, you know, they're losing habitat to megafires and so on, right? So this idea of, you know, of kind of connected ecosystems that, uh, you know, animals can move through. I mean, that's, you know, that would be important on any planet, but, you know, one that's uh, getting hotter, it's, uh, you know, it's especially critical. And, you know, again, that's why those wildlife crossings are so important, right? Because, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're an, an elk and, uh, you know, you suddenly, you know, lost a big chunk of your habit habitat to a fire or something like that, and you know you you have to access other habitat. Well, you know, if uh, I ninety is in your way, you know that's a that's a big that's a big problem, right? So those those wildlife crossings, I think, are, are really uh, kind of crucial climate adaptation strategies as, as well, and that's a big part of what uh, why do I work on noise pollution? Yeah, uh, how about road noise yeah. pollution? Alan wanted to ask that. That's where I was aimed at. What how? How big a subject is the noise pollution, and how does how does the wildlife react to it? What is that something you spend a lot of time with? Yeah, you know, I've got a I've got a chapter uh, about about noise pollution in this in this book, and it's and it's a huge problem. I think it's a problem that you know most of us don't think about, right? I mean, especially people living in urban areas. Uh, you know, we're just so surrounded by cars and roads and traffic. We, we, we kind of shut our brains off and, you know, don't notice that noise. I, I was, uh, you know, I read a lot of this book while living in, in, uh, Spokane, Washington, uh, you know, basically, uh, along the side of I-90. And, you know, I, I really wasn't thinking about that until, uh, I started reading some of the scientific literature about the health impacts of road noise. And, you know, you realize that road noise and noise pollution in general, you know, it's, it, it elevates our blood pressures and our heart Heart rates and our risk of cardiac disease and stroke and diabetes, you know, it's, it's literally killing us, you know, and it's, it's, uh, kind of a similar problem for, for wild animals. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, imagine being a, you know, an owl that has to listen for the, you know, the sound of a rodent's feet in the leaf litter or, you know, a songbird that has to sing to attract a mate, right? And if, you know, if, if that, you know, that crunch of the rodent's foot or, or your song is being drowned out by the, you know, the rumble of, uh, of engines and tires, you know, that's, that you can't live in that place, right? It's, it's really functionally this form of habitat loss. So, you know, a road itself might only be, you know, a hundred feet wide from shoulder to shoulder. And yet that noise pollution is kind of billowing into the surrounding ecosystem and is, you know, potentially chasing animals away from, uh, you know, an area that can span a couple of miles. Is, is, is sound pollution really gonna change all of, all that's around us? I mean, 
Is it going to change the dimensions of, of our, of our protected areas and, uh, how, how much is that going to affect how we, how we treat our land? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a really good question. There's, there's this great, um, sort of scientific experiment that I think gets to that question that I, I describe in the book, which is uh, this experiment called the, the Phantom Road. And, and basically what these researchers in, in Idaho did was that they, you know, they, they played the, the noise of traffic. They recorded traffic and they played the noise of traffic in uh, this, you know, roadless area of forest in, in Idaho. And they found that, you know, that migrating birds avoided the area. Uh, because, you know, again, if you're, you know, if you're a migrating songbird, you know, you have to be able to listen for the sound of a predator approaching, right? You know, a hawk or a falcon or a fox or, or what have you. And, you know, if you can't hear that predator coming, you know, that's not a place that you want to live, right? It's not a place that you're, you're safe. Um, but, you know, what I thought was so telling and interesting about that experiment was that, you know, the, the traffic recording that they played, the, that noise pollution, the recording didn't come from, you know, I-90, a, a big, uh, you know, interstate highway. It actually came from going to the Sun Road in, in Glacier National Park, right? A, a protected area where, you know, animals are, are safe from, you know, hunting and development and all of these other pressures. But, you know, they're not safe from road noise because, of you know, of course, uh, so many of our national parks have, you know, big roads running through the middle of them, right? That's how we, that's how we experience places like Glacier and Yosemite and Yellowstone and Saguaro, uh, you know, we experience them uh, from our, our cars, right? Um, well, and they're heavily so, trafficked. I mean, they're heavily trafficked. Exactly. And I mean, they, these places get millions of visitors every every year. Um, so, you know, if, if birds and other animals don't feel safe in those protected areas, you know, where are they? Where are they safe? And to me, that, you know, that really hints at the need to start limiting traffic in, in these national parks. You know, we've, we've seen parks like Denali and, you know, and Zion that have gone to these, these shuttle systems, uh, you know, bus systems where, you know, where private vehicles are basically prohibited from uh, much of the park. Uh, and that's, you know, really cut down on noise pollution. And I think that's the, the kind of thing we need to be looking at, uh, you know, in basically all of our protected areas is, is limiting traffic and uh, limiting road noise. Dan, do you think we're not enough aware of road road noise that we're uh, we're talking about it right now and this is good but uh or do, do we just kind of ignore it and go on down the road and it's maybe a bigger factor than what <laughs> what we realize yeah i i think i think so you know i mean one of the i was talking a minute ago about kind of the health impacts of road noise on, on us humans you know and just one of the really incredible studies that I, I read was a, a study set in uh, in Paris uh, which basically found that you know, controlling for all the factors people the noisiest parts of Paris lived three years shorter than people in the quietest parts right so so road noise is literally taking years off of our lives and you know again it's it's kind of doing the same uh, for, uh, you know, for, for wildlife. And, and so, you know, I, I do think it's, it's one of these great, you know, unsung public health crises. Of course, I've, uh, I've got an ironic story every once in a while, you know, we're a dude range and, and we do hear the road a little bit, but not much. Yeah. And, and every once in a while, maybe once or twice a year, a guest will say to me, you know, uh, I didn't sleep very well last night. It was just too quiet. I'm just, I'm, you know, they're going to have to bring a recording of road noise or something just so they can get their sleep here at the dude range. Um, I'm, it's not a joke, by the way. Um, 2021 infrastructure bill is what's its impact on roads and the road ecology? Yeah, you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I think the impacts are are, are kind of mixed, right? Uh, I mean, so look, so so first of all, there you know there are some really big pots of money for some you know some really important projects. You know, there's there's this three hundred and fifty million dollar uh, pot of funding for new wildlife crossings. So that's you know. Uh, there's a, a billion dollars for uh, replacing culverts that uh, you know prevent fish from moving upstream. You know, like you're, you were describing uh, that stream at, at and the uh, near the ranch in Montana that's uh, 
you know, impacted by a road. So that, that kind of situation, you know, replacing culverts that uh, prevent fish migration. You know, there's a bunch of money for, uh, you know, road decommissioning on, uh, on forest service lands, right? So that's, that, you know, that's, that's all, that's all good stuff. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there's also, uh, look, there's, you know, there's $350 million for, you know, new wildlife crossings. And then there's $110 billion, you know, for highway upgrades and expansions, right? That's, you know, that's just going to make the, you know, the problem worse. So, uh, you know, in, in some sense, you know, we're, we're devoting more money to, uh, you know, ecological infrastructure than ever before. And yet we, you know, we need so much more money, right? I mean, $350 million for wildlife crossings is a, you know, it's, it's not even a drop in the bucket. It's, you know, it's a, a molecule of H2O in the bucket. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're funding this sort of thing better and thinking about it more. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really uh, just scratching the surface of, uh, you know, what we need to do. How do you get all that out in front of people? Sorry, what, is it one more time? I say, how do you, this subject, how do you get it more publicized or out in front of the public so the, so people are aware that this is a problem? Starts with Ben's book. <laughs> yeah, okay. write, a, write a book about the subject. Well, I was publicizing <laughs> your book there. You just didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, you know, I think that one of the, one of the important things about the, about this topic, right, is that, you know, there's, there's really something for any, for everybody in it, right? You know, that, that yes, obviously, you know, letting these wildlife migrations and movements continue is really important, but also, you know, no driver wants to hit an animal either, right? You know, we know that, uh, the elk are, are really, you know, dangerous, uh, incidents in hundreds of People die every year in animal crashes. You know, it costs society something like eight billion dollars uh, every year in uh, you know vehicle repair, and hospital bills, insurance costs, and the rest of it. Uh, you know, obviously hunters uh, are you know hunters hate roadkill because you know of course they're at uh, healthy deer and elk populations you know as much as anybody, right? So you know this is one of the issues that. It has, it kind of has something for everybody, right? And, and, uh, so that's, you know, I think we need to be, uh, you know, just reaching out to more and more constituencies and, and just, uh, you know, getting this issue uh, top of mind for more groups of people. All right. Well, well, let's, um, in your book, uh, well, you've got a couple of them, of course. Um, crossings, how road ecology is shaping the future of our planet. And then we didn't even get talked about the beavers. So we'll have to do that another time. <laughs> I love Next the time. name Eager, the surprising secret life of beavers and why they matter. Um, they're out everywhere, I assume. Yeah, any, anywhere that uh, books can be found and that uh, beavers can be found. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to get, is there, do you have a website? I think I was on your website actually this morning. Yeah, it's just uh, bengoldfarb.com. Yeah, um, right. And that, that can link to the books and give them information on what you're doing. Fantastic. Well, th thank you guys so much for uh, for the great questions. It was fun to hear your own uh, ranch stories as well, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you at the festival. Yep, we'll see you at the uh, Tucson Festival of Books. And uh, let's see, that's uh, March 9th and 10th. So we'll see you there. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, man. It's All been right. a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks, gentlemen, and that is truly Stories Up and For the Road. Hey, and it's time for you to perhaps get on the road again. That's right. Uh, the Tucson Book Festival is coming up, and some of you are going to make your way to the southwest to uh, see all of that. Some of you are going to, uh, hey, we got to go to Tucson for that wonderful gem festival every year, and that is quite an appearance and quite uh, a show to see. I know my wife always looked forward to uh, the coming of the Tucson Gem Festival and uh, all of the good things. And she would buy quite a few things there, too. And, of course, the spring training season is coming up in Arizona. And so this is a good time for you to find that southwest, that Arizona vacation spot for you.
Of course, maybe you want to try the Dude Ranch community, so reach out to whitestallion.com, whitestallion.com. Now, here's the deal. They may not have a room for you right now. (laughs) This is somewhat, of course, the busy season. But they are connected to the True Ranch Connection, and there's a good possibility that they may not have quite the White Stallion place for you, but there are a number of other fine, fully accredited, beautiful dude ranches that they are in a cooperative friendship and fellowship with, and perhaps they can uh, make that arrangement for you, too. So just check out the website, whitestallion.com, whitestallion.com. Check that out. Give them a call and uh, tell them, uh, I want to have a uh, an experience, a real adventure, and they'll find a way to do that just for you. Whitestallion. And that's a wrap from Arizona, estimated to have about 150,000 miles of road. A cowboy thanks to Stan Houston's production team. Tune in next week when we get Western and talk about The Cowboy Way with author David McCumber, who wrote about his year as a ranch hand up in Montana. Until then, this is Lynn Weezy Sneed reminding you to sit tall and ride safe. road again Just can't wait to get on the road again The life I love is making music with my friends And I can't wait to get on the road again On the road again Going places that I've never been Seeing things that I may never see again I can't wait to get on the road again